We are here for argument in cause number 1 CACV 180562, Fernandez Living Trust versus RIPS. And these pr proceedings are being audio and video recorded, so we would please ask counsel to identify yourself and your client at the beginning of your argument. Each side will have 20 minutes. Appellant's counsel is advised that you're responsible for watching the clock to reserve a portion of that time for rebuttal if you desire. We've read the briefs. We've discussed this case in conference this morning. Counsel, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, uh, Gary Grinkowich, Grinkowich Law Firm, Las Vegas, Nevada, for the appellants, the Fernandez Trust. <clears throat> Your Honors, this case started out as basically an attempt on summary judgment to say that the plaintiffs had nothing by way of reliable evidence uh, that would sustain their cause of action. I'm not going to go through the, the facts in this case, but basically the, you had two people that during Mr. Fernandez, the original co-trustor's lifetime, had a relationship whereby they lent money back and forth uh, and as Mr. Fernandez was getting on, he mentioned to his son uh, several times that he was concerned that Mr. Rips, who owned Fripp's construction company, uh, owed them a lot of money and it hadn't been paid back. Uh, Mr. Now, Fernandez, it, it I'm it sorry. It like the issue was whether uh, the parties agreed that interest would be paid on the $55,000 and $74,000 loans that were made. Well, that's partially correct. Uh, one of the, there, there were three deeds of trust given at a certain point in time. One of them was for $72,000. One was for $55,000. And the third was for $37,700. Mr. Rips, who had the pleasure of not having Mr. Fernandez alive to contradict anything he said, claimed that the 37,000, the 37,700 uh, deed of trust related to work to be done on a project that hadn't been done yet, which is what the $55,000 deed right. of trust was. So, and, the, and the, there's no evidence that a loan of $37,000 was made by the trust to Fripps. Instead, as I understand the argument, that was uh, the, the, the 37,000 was thought to be, by your account, the, the interest that would be due on the other two deeds of trust and prior debt. That's the part where I was going to okay. differentiate the prior debt. The handwritten notes that your client offered in response to the motion for summary judgment arguably support the notion that Fripps paid interest from time to time on, pr on prior debt. In other words, they rebut Mr. Fripps's contention that, or Mr. Ripps' contention that, no, no, we never, I never paid interest. So they do show a pattern. They, they can be used to show a pattern of interest being owed and interest being paid. How do these handwritten notes come into evidence? Well, number one, they're, we believe they are business record exceptions to the hearsay rule. Number two, I, I, and we don't agree they're hearsay, uh, the, the appellees claim that they were hearsay. The written notes are not being offered to show that the interest calculations were correct. They're being offered to show the decedent's state of mind because who would sit down and do these types of calculations if, unless he was, I mean, there'd be no reason to do them if there were no interest to be charged and there would be no reason for Mr. Fripps, 
other than his claim, which is sort of audacious considering there was already a deed of trust for stuff that hadn't been done. So they're being offered to show that Mr. Fernandez expected to be paid interest. Correct. And that Mr. Fripps, Ripps, excuse me, expected to pay interest because he signed a deed of trust in that amount, give or take $10, which is 0.028%, like two thousandth of a percent difference than the exact calculations made at the exact same time that Mr. Fernandez made. And the long and the short of it is, is the judge never said there's anything unreliable about these notes. Was there any other evidence, though, that, that Mr. Fernandez reported interest as taxable income during the uh, course of dealing of these parties? Um, I mean, he was an accountant, so presumably if he was receiving interest, he would have... His, his tax returns never came into evidence and... So they were never offered So they were never offered and... That, okay. I was just asking if there was any evidence of that out there. And, and there's also no evidence of a deduction for non-payment, so uh, I, I'm sure he did uh, report the interest that he... I don't know that, so I don't want to leave the record. I was just asking. There's... there's um, how do you say the handwritten notes are not hearsay because they're not offered because they're offered only to show Mr. Fernandez's state of mind how do they show that state of mind well if somebody sits down and lists I, I, I never counted the number of loans and multiplies that times the number of days times a percentage it, it, it's not he, he's not determining somebody's batting average or his era he's determining some mathematical formula and the only one that i can think since 365 seems to keep showing up is daily interest and there's only re one reason why a person would take the time to do that uh, given that they relate to other loans that had taken place and there were some show, showing of payments during that time and it's squaring up our accounts uh, now whether you know if, if his calculations are not correct that that can be shown but the purpose of entering them into evidence in a case such as this is not to show that these amounts are correct it's to show this is the deal this is more likely than not the deal here and here you've got an accountant who does this as a did this as a business until he retired um, the, and keeps the books for the trust and for his family uh, and therefore if they are hearsay it, it would come in under the business records exception. Uh, there, there's no indication that there was an argument between Rips and Mr. Fernandez before he passed away. In fact, Mr. Rips signed a promissory note for an amount that is almost to the penny identical to what Mr. Fernandez figured, and therefore going back to our more likely than not standard, uh, you know, it, it, it's like when, when you're dealing with a decedent, it's almost like dealing with an expert. No matter what the expert says, it's his opinion. You can't prove that what he's saying is inaccurate, what except by circumstantial evidence. What was the note that you just referred to? You well, there, there's no note. It's a deed of trust. You said he signed a note almost uh, identical. To I, I should have said deed of trust. That was misspeaking on my part. I'm sorry. What's what what what's your explanation though for why Mr. Fernandez executed the release as to the thirty-seven thousand dollar deed of trust? Well, what seems to be overlooked in this, and first of all, the judge basically said that 
and I think he misread the statute, and the appellee has taken the position that I've got some gripe with the statute or that we have a gripe with it. That's not true. The statute says what the statute says, and there's a good reason why the statute says what it says. Is An escrow transaction is not a two-party transaction in a situation like this. You've got a lender and a borrower on the seller side. You got an escrow company that's got to insure title. You've got somebody who's buying a premises that presumably they're going to live in or do whatever with. You've got their lender, and basically the transaction involves more than just the builder and his lender, and there are numerous reasons why a lender who is doing business on an ongoing relationship can say, look, I stand to make $130,000 here. I still have $40,000 at risk if I get the release. And this is my friend. We do deals all the time. He's not going to stick me for $40,000. Uh, in other words, so, I'm going to allow the sale to go through on some sort of promise. I will get paid the interest that I'm on. And, and, is this house going to sell for $40,000 to some other buyer? Nobody knows that. So there are numerous reasons why somebody would sign a release, specifically uh, for reducing their risk. But it wasn't just a release. It was also um, a, representation, a representation or a proclamation that the underlying debt had been satisfied. Well, there so are all sorts of reasons you might release a deed that don't involve satisfaction of the debt, pragmatic reasons. But but here there was a, a statement that the, deed, that the debt had been satisfied. Just as in a case where there's no dispute between the parties and one puts payment in full on a bottom of a check in bad faith. Uh, I'm not saying anything was done in bad faith here. But be careful there, because when you put payment in full on a check, whether in good faith or bad faith, Article Three of the UCC uh, makes those magic words legally operative. And I think your argument here is that we don't have a statute in this case that makes the words legally operative. They're just words. Correct. Okay. But why put those words in there if they're not true? Because they weren't necessary to release the, the security. Well, the, the, they are in a standard form agreement. And, and the issue here, and under Arizona law, when people enter into an agreement, the idea is to look at their state of mind, not exactly what the words may say. You've got a standard form agreement to get this escrow closed. And, uh, you know, I, I can't tell you exactly what was on Mr. Fernandez's mind. I mean, I would love to be able to ask him that, and that's one of the issues in this case. So, and, and what we've argued all along is that the burden should be on Mr. Fernandez. To show, all he has to do is show that he paid it. You've, uh, you've mentioned the word agreement a couple of times. Apart from these releases, is there any agreement? These, these seem to be unilateral acts. Is there any actual contractual agreement in the record we should be looking at that I may have missed? No, no. The, 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 as a matter of fact, you mentioned what the deeds of trust talk about, and the deeds of trust talk about an underlying agreement or an underlying note. There is no such animal here. Um, th th they are standard form agreements that were quite, I don't know if the evidence, but they were not prepared by Mr. Uh, Fernandez. <clears throat> and in them, like I say, they refer to an agreement that doesn't exist unless you're referring to a handshake agreement, and uh, we have no way of showing what that is except what the numbers in the deeds, deed of trust is, which are filled in by hand. Is the, is, is the beneficiary's deed of full release an agreement such that it's subject to the uh, parole evidence rule? I mean, what, what it's a statement. It's a statement that says the indebtedness has been fully paid, satisfied, and discharged. But is that a contract? I'm, I'm just wondering whether the parole evidence rule applies. Well, it, it, it says the, I believe it talks about the underlying. And when people come into these things, they are free to make new deals. And, okay, I'm releasing this deed of trust 
That doesn't mean I've been paid. It means I'm releasing the deed of trust and the obligation that was secured by the deed of trust. We won't go after that property. We won't bring an in rem proceeding against that property because we are releasing it from all obligations prior. But <clears throat> it, it does not say I've been paid. I've received the cash. And so there can be a new transaction whereby there's a reaffirmation of the indebtedness between these two people, which by itself satisfies the obligation. We don't know that for sure because Mr. Fernandez isn't here to give his side of the story, but there is a profit and loss statement prepared by the appellees in this case that shows a $60,000 indebtedness to Mr. Fernandez. What's your best argument that the business records exception would apply to any of those documents? Well, he kept them in the regular course of what he did as a business. I believe that uh, a someone's personal business can be, uh, we all have to pay taxes, so we all have to keep accurate records. Uh, there is no indication in this. I mean, Mr. Rips trusted his entrusted his books to Mr. Fernandez. Apparently, he didn't think he was being taken for a ride, or there was anything untrustworthy about him. There's nothing indicating during their lifetime there was any dispute between these two gentlemen as to what the obligations were. And in lieu of a custodian of records, you, the, the son's statements about identifying the handwritten, the handwriting, is, does, that, does that satisfy the, the business records exception? I believe so. Uh, in a criminal case, somebody who worked with somebody satisfied the um, authentication rule by saying, I recognize his handwriting. And here you've got somebody's son who's seen his father's handwriting over and over and over again, who finds this writing in his father's office, along with his father's other papers, uh, and says, this is my father's handwriting. Uh, I believe beyond a reasonable doubt that serves as authentication for the, you know, I, I guess you can certainly asked Mr. Fernandez Jr., did you write this and say it was your father's or, or, or whatever? He's subject to cross-examination, but he certainly authenticated the documents under the rule. And I'll reserve if I may. All right. Thank, thank you very you. much. <clears throat> Mr. Hundley. Thank you and good morning to all of you. Uh, I'm Richard Hunley. I represent the defendants in Appalese, George Rips, Mercedes Rips, and Fripps Mojave Construction LLC. Uh, I know you have things you want to ask me about, and I want to comment on some of the things he mentioned, but I want to I just want to back up a little bit and talk about what's being appealed. The judgment resulted from our motion for summary judgment. It was granted in full as to all parties and all claims. It was granted in three stages. The court's first ruling granted it as to two counts, count one for an accounting and count five for a, uh, for fraud. And that was because the plaintiff did not oppose those, uh, the plaintiff in its response did not address or oppose the motion as to them. So those were dismissed, though that ruling is not appealed. The court next, in the minute entry resulting from the oral argument, granted the motion as to all claims against the individual defendants, Mr. and Mrs. Rips. That appears to be included in this appeal, but I would point out that in neither in the response to the motion for summary judgment, nor in these appellate briefs, is there any mention of how the individuals, the Ripses, would be liable. There's no tribal issue of fact there. There is no allegation that there was a contract with the Rips. The deed of trust was extended on property owned by the entity, Fripps Mojave Construction. It was signed in the name of Fripps Mojave Construction. To the extent there were loans made and there's bank accounts or checks, they show they went to Fripps Mojave Construction. To the extent there were repayments, they came from Fripps Mojave Construction. So there's just nothing in the record to support any claim against the individual defendants. So the issue then becomes whether the summary judgment is grant as to the remaining claims against the entity Fripps Mojave Construction is uh, 
was accurate and not accurate was the right decision and I think it is there is no there is no tribal issue of fact and I'll go through that for several reasons there's really two claims here first is that forty thousand dollars they claim was owed even after the releases of the deed of trust uh, to answer Judge Johnson's question a deed it can be construed as a contractual agreement we cited the case of Valento V-A-L-E-N-T-O in our brief that's at 225 Arizona 477 so those three deeds of re they release it, it's a beneficiary's deed of release but it's not what did mr. Fernandez get for signing this a hundred and twenty four thousand nine hundred dollars as to the thirty three thousand thirty seven thousand well he signed three releases no, this, this is the release for the third okay what did what, what was the consideration mr. Fernandez Scott for signing this what's the contract element of this the contract was there are three deeds of trust totaling 164,900 he did a payoff demand for 124,900 in exchange for a release he received the money so he got 124,900 dollars in exchange for releasing all three deeds of trust why why does that make sense it makes sense because as mr. rips has testified without any anything to dispute him is that the 37 7 these were no interest loans there was no document anywhere that suggests that interest was ever charged or paid mr. Ripps never received 1099s or rather Fripps never received 1099s plaintiff never provided the tax returns to show that uh, interest was paid there's no document anyway anywhere which shows interest is going to be charged or paid so George Ripps said in his declaration that those three deeds of trust pertain to a specific project that his company was working on on Motherlode Road. There was $72,200, which was loaned already. There was $55,000, which we know is going to be loaned and is going to be loaned immediately after. And there may be additional amounts. I'm going to need to finish this project. And that's where the 37-7 came from. That's, that's pretty specific, though those amounts seven seven what what was if if there was already some acknowledgement that the fifty five thousand might be owed why didn't what does mr. Rip say about why didn't they just lob in another thirty seven or forty thousand into the second deed of trust because he knew the fifty five was going to be needed he didn't know if there was going to be other amounts needed and beyond that discovery was not done by plaintiff to flush out those facts isn't it it's an it's an odd transaction well, gives a security interest of thirty-seven thousand seven hundred dollars in an amount that may never even be lent. I don't. I can only. I can only conjecture that there was construction budgets. But you there have was a client you can talk to. You don't have to conjecture. Well, he's, we we are we are looking at at what evidence exists on the records from which reasonable people either could not or could agree. Uh -huh. But. But you don't have to only conjecture that, that your client. I, mean, I, I would I would be very hard to convince today to sign a deed of trust for thirty seven thousand seven hundred dollars if I didn't expect to get thirty seven thousand seven hundred dollars. Yet well, your client I mean, did. Well, first of all, I think we probably all have signed credit lines for maybe fifty thousand when we haven't borrowed anything. So that's not that unusual. The question is whether the money is going to actually be lent down the road. And Mr. Ripps, the evidence we have on that issue is Mr. Ripps's affidavit, his declaration rather, and he testified that I thought I might need additional monies other than the 72 plus the 55. And so that's why we had this. Now, how he budgeted that amount, the record doesn't show, but I assume it was an estimate as to what it might have cost to finish the job if there is overruns or problems develop or changes are needed. But I don't think we have to get into the mystery of how these numbers came up because the plaintiff, Richard Fernandez, rather, Ricardo Fernandez, did sign releases. He did say their payment in full. He did not reserve or sign any document that says that I'm releasing these deeds of trust, but there are additional amounts owed, and the statute allows them to do that. So we have releases there. And under the parole evidence rule, while plaintiff is offering parole evidence of some sort that no, there's additional amounts owed, but as counsel Mr. Grenkowicz said, Grenkowicz said, 
he wishes he knew what was going on in Mr. Fernandez's mind, but he can't. He doesn't know because he's dead, and that's why this is a hard case to defend and a hard case to prosecute. But you know what's going on, or you have access to your client. Is is there evidence in the record that that e explains the entire course of dealing? There was affidavits. For example, why are there why are there three deeds of trust? 72-2 had already been loaned. That's the first deed of trust. But you could do it. You could do all this in one deed of trust, with the understanding that once it's all satisfied, that one deed of trust will be released. We could, but they didn't. They didn't here. That, that, that's true. I mean, they broke it down. The seventy-two thousand dollars that has already been loaned, either for this or another project or whatever. So here's a deed of trust on that. And again, these were with no promissory notes. With no promissory notes. These these were friends. Yes. And yet they, they undertook the effort to engage in an unnecessarily complex uh, series of security instruments um, o over over undocumented loans. Doesn't That's doesn't true. that doesn't that open the question for a finder of fact of what was really going on? I don't. I think you need more than that to find a tribal issue of fact. I mean, well, we don't, we that, don't have that the gets notes. Then to the to the uh, the notes, as we've been calling them collectively. Yeah, but we don't have any notes. Well, we oh, you mean the handwritten do. notes? The handwritten notes. I'm sorry, I thought you meant a promissory note. Yeah. Well, the trial court allowed that in, probably in the exercise of caution. It is not a business record. Why not? Uh, because this is a retired gentleman. He is not a lender. He is just doodling. Okay. Uh, say 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 we conclude that. He was, it's, it's not business, it's in the course of regularly conducted activity. And there, he was regularly making loans to Fripps. So what, why else is it not a business record? Are they not business Well, under the statute, it has to be a record made at or near the time by someone with knowledge. We don't know when he did these. They're not dated. Well, you can match them up, though, with the, uh, with the transactions in the bank statements. Well, perhaps well, we don't know when he prepared the document. This could be, well, did he do it all at one sitting? Maybe he thought, gee, how much did I lose by not charging George the interest? Or did he do it entries as time went on? We don't know that answer. It has to be kept in the course of a regularly conducted activity of a business, organization, occupation, or calling. He was not in the business to loan money. There's no organization here. There's no occupation here. This was a retired man who was loaning money on a verbal agreement to his friend's company. That's not a business. Uh, if you have a retiree operating a lemonade stand part time, um, reporting the income on Schedule C, that's a business, right? Reporting on Schedule Yes. Okay. And here you have a retiree who is engaging in serial loan transactions that are are serious enough or arm's length enough that security instruments were executed. And your position is that there's no business component to that? I don't think one friend loaning money to one friend is a business. No, if, 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 I, if nope. I loan my friend 20 bucks for lunch today, that's not a business. But if I take out a, a security interest in real estate three separate times, um, that, that starts to sound more business-like, doesn't it? Perhaps, perhaps. But here we also... Plaintiff, Mr. Fernandez, he never bothered to document any of his business activities, never bothered to document these loans. There's nothing in writing that says interest is going to be accruing. There's there nothing showing interest evidence, was paid. There's circumstantial evidence to show that it was paid in the past. Right? There's evidence about, about payments to Mr. Fernandez that would establish potentially uh, a course of dealing demonstrating the payment of interest. But there's no evidence that there was interest included. To the contrary, Mr. Ripp says no interest was included. But the notes undermine that. The notes under the notes show calculated interest that matches up with deposits made into the trust bank account. Mm -hmm. That's true. Which the inference from that one might draw is that contrary to Mr. Ripp's declaration, Fripps did indeed pay interest to the trust in the past. 
I, I, I think if I can just add to that, your client has never offered either tax returns or a declaration to suggest that he never deducted the interest. Well, he said that he, he didn't pay any interest. So he didn't deduct any interest because he didn't pay any interest. So if, if his tax returns were to be produced, presumably you're representing to this court that there would be no deduction. I understand that there was no interest ever deducted. Tax returns? No, I have not. Okay. So you can't really represent to us what he deducted Correct. or not? Correct. But again, the trial court didn't have that, and plaintiff had the opportunity to do that discovery if it wanted to. Plaintiff could have offered its own tax returns to show interest was... Well, and your client had an obligation to disclose without discovery. But it wasn't requested. It but didn't seem to be an disclosed. issue. We said Even we... though it's, it's relevant to an issue in the case, there are records that would presumably show the presence or absence of such interest deductions. They exist, they're relevant, and they were not disclosed. Is that correct? The tax returns were not disclosed. Plaintiff never took the position that my client's tax records were relevant. What about the argument that your colleague makes about the bit, you don't have to even get to whether these are, that the handwritten notes are business records because they're not being offered for the truth of the matter. Instead, they're offered, they're, they're being offered to show Mr. Fernandez's intent, understanding, expectation. The statement of mind exception is, I mean, not a, not a business strategy. A statement of mind kind of goes to, you know, fear, hatred, anger, something like that. Not, not your understanding of what a contract is. So I, the contents of that document are clearly hearsay. And the ultimate problem with allowing that document in is the author is dead. The author never discussed it with anybody. His son admits that. I can't cross-examine the author of that document. We can't determine its reliability. All the document is, is numbers. It's just guesswork as to what the intent was with that. Maybe he's calculating interest. Maybe he's calculating, gee, I should have charged George interest. That's the question, isn't it? Yes. But it was plaintiff's burden of proof to, to bring out something in response to the motion for summary judgment, and it didn't. But, but if, but if these notes show that interest was paid in the past, wouldn't that make them reliable? There was no evidence that any interest was ever paid in the past. The, this transaction didn't start in 2015. In fact, one of the first things that happened in 2015 was Fripps Mojave Construction paid about $105,000 to the plaintiff to repay prior loans. There was nothing anywhere, and we have asked for it, to show that there was interest included in these things. And that's consistent with, the gentleman's retired, apparently he's well off. He was also volunteering his services to Fripps Mojave Construction and doing the bookkeeping. He wasn't paid for that. And in fact, I believe it's, I, I believe it's in Mr. Ripps' declaration that he offered payment, and Mr. Fernandez said, if you pay me, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm just doing this for fun and for a friend. Before you sit down, let me ask you about the, the, the other issue, the second part of the case, the, the dispute about whether the 5,000, 15, 14,000, 6,000. When you look at the bank statements and the checking and the checkbook, you can see that Mr. Fernandez loaned Fripps $30,000 at some point the summer following this transaction. What, what, what evidence is there that that money was paid back? Well, there's the 20,000 that we've been, that's talked about in the brief. The plaintiff in its brief acknowledges two other payments totaling $10,000. None of these payments going one way or the other are identified as applying to any specific loan. And I would also point out that the argument that the plaintiff has raised in this appeal did not raise in response to the motion for summary judgment. Motion for summary judgment, we said, okay, plaintiff, you're claiming that we owe $6,000 loaned on May 15th, $14,000 loaned on April 15th. We disagree. The 6,000 was a loan. The 14,000 was an overpayment that we had made in the past as determined by Mr. Fernandez, and he gave the money back to us. The trial court, and this is quoted in its ruling, 
No other explanation has been provided with respect to these occurrences, and that is true as regards the summary judgment proceeding. They did not come up with this. Well, there's these other checks here, so we but, didn't get a chance to rebut that. But our review is de novo. Excuse me? Our review is de novo. I'm just looking at the accounting for the two loans made on, on July 28th of 2015 that total $30,000. When you, when you take those into account, I don't, I don't understand how it could be that your client could contend that the $14,000 paid by Fernandez in November was, was a refund. Well, that was not flushed out at the summary judgment stage. There were other repayments made by the defendants as well. I mean, the plaintiff is just kind of picking and choosing here for purposes of this brief. Every time we say, you know, we repaid this loan, we repaid this loan, they say, well, no, no, what about this? What about that? I mean, we, we answered them all at the summary judgment stage. But to emphasize what Judge Johnston just stated is we review this de novo and we take the evidence in light most favorable to, to the, the party opposing the summary judgment motion. So if we're looking at this evidence, why, why would we come to that conclusion? I think that's the question before you. Because you don't have any evidence from the plaintiff's side by way of declaration, a loan, I mean, a promissory note, an agreement, a demand letter, an email, or anything saying that these are new loans, you owe me this. We just have entries in a bank account. Well, there is nothing, there is no witness and there is no document tying those to be loans. Well, okay. We have, <laughs> on May 4th, a payment by Fernandez of $6,000. On July 28th, two payments totaling $30,000. And then the bank records show, uh, uh, Payments coming back from Fripps, uh, totaling thirty, but there's uh, there's just nothing to show that the six was ever repaid. I, I just well, I mean, again, why? in my brief, there was a fifty-five hundred dollar payment made after the guy died. There was that. July. This is July two thousand and fifteen. There's one hundred twenty-nine thousand four hundred, one hundred twenty-four thousand nine hundred dollars paid from escrow. There are other payments that are being made. This is just. Kind of a selective summary. Is other payments being made by by uh, Fripps Mojave Fripps. Construction. Well, okay, and, and we and we can we we know what those payments were because we can look at the bank books, at the bank statements, and the checkbook. Perhaps right? we see those payments, but we don't know what they apply to, and the plaintiff hasn't tied those together. And again, while you do have de novo, uh, you are to review de novo. I mean, you can't consider evidence which the plaintiff didn't provide to the trial court. And these other these other payments were not something that it argued to the trial court. Thank you, counsel. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just to put the last argument to bed, Page 35 of my opening brief, I refer to Daniel Fernandez, <clears throat> either affidavit or declaration. I was fully aware of the existence of the $20,000 branch deposit at the time I performed my review relating to this action, and the full $20,000 was credited to Fripps. Indeed, reviewing the August 2015 statement and the checks supporting it, copies of which I'm attaching here to, <clears throat> Uh, checks were written by the trust on 728 2015 to Fripps totaling $30,000 for $25,000 and two for $5,000. Shortly thereafter, the $20,000 branch deposit, which correlates to this check and referred to by the defense counsel, was made and in the following two months payments in the amount of $5,000 each were paid. <clears throat> I don't know how he could have referred to it any more strongly than he did there. He went through the exact same analysis that we went through in our brief, and counsel gets up and tells the court that we never mentioned it. And that's what's been going on through this whole case. Uh, in my reply brief, 
I, I believe I've covered the statements that are made as fact when, in fact, they are allegations made by Mr. Ripps. Uh, and I would just ask the, the court to recall that the trial judge found that the information provided by us was reliable and he considered it. His ruling was based on the conclusiveness of the statute with regard to purchasers for bona fide purchasers for value and their lenders. And it's not that conclusiveness does not relate to the trustor and the beneficiary under deeds of trust under the statute by its very terms. If the legislature had wanted to do that, they would have, and they didn't. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Council, thank you for your argument. The matter is deemed submitted. We'll issue a decision in due course.